I'm Matt Landau, and this is Unlocked, Season 6, Magic Zones. This episode is brought to you by Point Central, the leaders in smart home automation, and Breezeway, a best-in-class property care and operations platform. Today we're talking with Sharon Skurlock, who's the owner of Skurlock Farms, a vacation rental collection in Georgetown, Texas. And almost everything Sharon has learned about running a profitable vacation rental business, she learned on a farm. Over the years, Sharon has found her magic zone with a brilliant marketing niche for direct bookings. But she's also built a small business that contributes to the local economy and community in meaningful ways. Today we talk about her philosophy, about reviews, the purpose of tools in her life and her business, and her dream to make a human-size corn maze. Sharon's chosen to be rich by making her wants few and supplying them herself. Let's get into it. First of all, I'd like to say that the chair you're sitting on sounds incredibly quiet. <laughs> Good, because the other one is not. And this is this the first uh, podcast interview you've done from that office there? It is the very first from anywhere. From anywhere? Anywhere. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of honored. I'm completely lucky. Sharon, I'd first like to address the elephant in the room, and that is that we've known each other for how long now? Oh, goodness. However long you've had inner circle. So maybe like five years, six years. Okay. That includes a weekly digest every week, many of the weeks mentioning you. That includes videos on the blog. That includes countless phone calls. We've never actually met in person. But only today... After all those years, do you tell me that I've been pronouncing your name wrong the whole time? <laughs> that it's Sharon, not Sharon. <laughs> after, well, see, it didn't make any difference when it was just one time. But then after you featured this me on the weekly newsletter, my brother-in-law called and said, hey, I want to speak to this Sharon. <laughs> so <I had> to <laughs> well, why, didn't you, why didn't you ever tell me over all these years? It wasn't that important. All right. Well, I'm glad you told me now. <laughs> But your name is your name is spelled S H E R O N, right? That's correct. And that's different from S H A R O N. Is there any inspiration there from your mother? Oh yes, she was reading a Russian novel when she was pregnant with me, and one of the main characters was S H E R R O N. So she named me Sharon. When they typed up the birth certificate, they got it wrong. They got one R, but the handwritten one shows two R's. So I just go by S H E R O N. <laughs> I am feeling enlightened today because that just blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, there's no Sharon? <laughs> well, with that said, that out of the way, uh, I wanted to officially welcome you, my dear, to Unlocked. It has been so long in the making, this conversation. Uh, I have followed your amazing work that we're going to go through today, share for all of our listeners. Uh, from beyond the inner circle, I think you were one of the earlier su subscribers to VRMB, right? Yes, yes. And half the time we talk about vacation rental stuff and half the time we talk about food. Right. Right. So I, I'd like to kick this off by um, asking, what is your best Southern dish to cook? Ooh, uh, well, I can tell you my favorite meal, uh, black eyed peas that I've grown in the garden, Southern cornbread. Naturally. Coleslaw. Okay. Uh, baked potatoes, baked sweet potatoes. I love hash brown casserole, candied apples. There's just so, so many. Turnip greens, mustard greens. <laughs> <laughs> like a true Southerner, I ask you your one favorite dish and you have now gone into like 20. Um, and what about best vegetable to pickle? Ooh, different squashes. They make excellent pickles. Oh, like... Like zucchini and yellow squash? Zucchini and yellow squash mixed with carrots and onions. Oh. Interesting. Do you uh, like do a little boil first or do you just put them in raw? You uh, put them in raw. Oh, how about that? Um, okay. So we, you, we could turn this into a food podcast very quickly, but that's not what our listeners are here for. They're here to learn about your vacation rental wisdom. And I can say that confidently. I think you, Sharon are one of the wisest vacation rental professionals I have ever met. And I, I realized that when I sat down to begin doing my research for this interview, and I realized that you have just volumes 
of stories and lessons and successes and failures um, that you have shared with me. And it's actually really hard to get all of this down into one conversation, um, but we're going to try. This is definitely more research than I've done for any other guest in the history of the show, <laughs> but it's because your, your experience and your lessons span so many areas of life. The, the centerpiece here, of course, is vacation rentals, but you grew up on a farm. You have run actively a farm with your husband. Uh, so I want to just start with the real basics, and then I want to get into some of these bigger lessons that you've learned over the years that I think people could really benefit from, if that's okay with you. Sure. The, the original outline for this uh, interview that I sent you was the same outline that we've been using for most of our interviews. But then I realized like, wait a minute, <laughs> she is not like most people. This is a, a very unusual success story. So let's start off with, for those who don't know it, uh, what is Skurlock Farms? What is the vacation rental business and how many properties are included? Well, my mother was one of President Johnson's favorite artists and Skurlock Farms, the original 112 acres was property that mom and daddy bought. The pallet pad, which is our first rental, was her art studio that daddy totally built by himself. Then they built their dream home across the ravine, and we call it Rocky Overlook. Um, when mama passed away in 2010, I inherited the two homes and the six acres around it. Uh, and by then, Dan and I owned the rest of the home. We were going to make them long-term rentals, but I thought, ugh. We had had rentals in the past, and you know, every time someone moves out, you've got to go in and totally redo. We had stayed in vacation rental homes for 20 years on our family vacations, and I thought, you know, I'm going to make this a vacation rental, uh, or both of them I did, and we have loved it, and so that that's how we got started. So when you officially decide to get into the vacation rental business, this was with your partner in crime, Mr. Dan, correct? Mr. Dan, that's right. What What's his role in this business? Uh, <laughs> the naysayer. <laughs> Dan just thinks uh, that a vacation rental should be just a place with a bed, something clean that people can sleep in. He did not understand why I wanted to decorate and make them really, really nice and add all the little extra touches. And he just thought I was going way overboard. And I told a guest that one time that we met out walking on the drive and she said, oh no. She said, I told my husband, oh, she even has toothpicks. Uh, <laughs> she said, it's all those little touches that make it so special. And I told him, I said, see, uh, people do appreciate. And when he started seeing the bookings coming in, did he become a believer? Yes. And the first year when we first got started, I said, you know what? I bet we can make $60,000 this year. And he said, oh, Sharon, don't be ridiculous. Well, we did way over 60. So it, he's always surprised, but he's not. Uh, so he just kind of turns me loose. Uh, and that's that's the rentals are my baby. Uh, I turn him loose with the farm part of it. And um, he, he makes his decisions on equipment. And I make my decisions on the vacation rentals. And it works very, very well. So I want to talk about the farm in a little bit. And I also want to talk about tools that are used in your respective domains. Okay. Um, but you shared with me a great, a great um, mantra that sometimes uh, Dan says to you. And I'm curious if you can uh, explain what this means to other partners in our industry. What does it mean to get off the football field? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that's what you're going to say. When I was six years old, <laughs> We had a Mayfade at school, and my class were dressed up like little goldfish. And Mama told me, now she said, Sharon, when they start, you stay in place and you let the teacher take care of everything. Well, she said, we got out on the football field and I'm running up and down the line, pushing everyone into place where they should be. So that's me making sure everyone's doing what they need to do. <laughs> and so who's call, Who's yeah, who's shouting, get off the football field at who? <laughs> Dan is shouting it at me. <laughs> So this, this kind of partnership that you guys have both in life and, and in business in a way, um, it requires its divisions and its responsibilities, uh, but you have really just soared with the vacation rental side of things. Um, we were kind of tracking your, your 
direct bookings and, and your niche marketing, which is something I'd like to get into in, in just a moment. Uh, but explain real quickly the phases uh, post COVID from kind of the peak COVID maybe up until now, how has the business um, responded? It's done very well. We're lucky that we're in the feast uh, category. We chose to shut down on March 1st and refunded in full everyone that had booked. <clears throat> and I had repeat guests that <laughs> begged if they could stay. But I said, you know, we're just so worried for your safety and for ours. We thought it was best to close. So we reopened September 1st and we have been booked. Uh, it's been a blessing. People are loving and they comment, you know, we're so happy to be able to get out and, you know, in the country where we can feel safe. We're not staying in a hotel, but just get out and breathe fresh air and be able to do something and feel safe with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember your phrase, uh, uh, what do you use? Uh, when dirt is gold yes. was your phrase. And I think my, my, my application here is that in this new travel landscape, the simplest thing that you've got, your vacation rental property is all of a sudden in a new spotlight. It's newly appreciated in some way. And it sounds like you guys are, are benefiting from that. Yes, absolutely. Explain to us how this kind of adversity, uh, this, this hard time, uh, compared with maybe some other thing, hard times that you've experienced, whether it's with the farm or, or life in general, how, how do you sort of handle the hard moments? We used it to our advantage. Um, one thing was, uh, I've always felt like you were a mentor to me. Um, you said one time in a conversation in early June, I want you to write a book. And so I did. <laughs> I had always wanted to write a book, but I never knew, you know, about what or how to or whatever. So I did. It took me about two months and had a blast doing it. And it was a fantastic trip down a trip down memory lane. It brought back a lot of memories. Um, we decided to plant more gardens and grow more food. So we did. We uh, planted a garden so that when our, we had planted one pre-COVID for our guests and it did very, very well, but <laughs> they weren't here to pick the produce. So we picked it. What, what kind of produce did you grow? Tomatoes and cucumbers, squash, zucchini, all kinds of herbs. And I'm not, I'm very frugal. I'm not going to let anything go to waste. So we canned and preserved everything. Well, then we realized we can't eat it all before the spring garden. So we evolved into a farm stand this fall. And luckily the first guest back in September got the last of the Italian zucchini. Mm. So they were able to enjoy a little bit. So we just did stuff on the, you know, around the farm, um, did little repairs on the houses. Uh, one of the septic tanks went out. It was a perfect time because it took uh, a couple of weeks to get that totally replaced and handled. And we were lucky we didn't have guests at the time. So we just we just enjoyed the time. Dan loved it because I couldn't volunteer anymore. You know, we were staying on the farm. So he, he loves it when I'm here. So COVID has not hurt him at all in that respect. He's enjoyed the, the together time. And so that means that you're back up to full speed right now? Full speed on the, st on the farm. We still are uh, staying, you know, doing curbside pickup for groceries and have not been in a restaurant since February. We do take out. Uh, we go to church virtually. Uh, do board meetings virtually. So we're still staying safe and we're doing the same thing with our, with our guests. Uh, some of them don't, you know, mask and they say, Oh, come on in. You know, when I take the muffins down, but we say, no, no, we'll <laughs> keep each other safe. So. And have you, have you guys um, made any adjustments to processes or um, protocol with regards to safety and or cleanliness post COVID? Yes. Uh, I'm paying my housekeeper an extra $10 for each cleaning because she's taking extra time. She always cleaned and disinfected, but now we're sanitizing also. So she cleans from top to bottom and so many guests comment on cleanliness. In fact, Christmas, uh, I did one of those things I learned on the inner circle from one of your uh, members. And I can't remember who it was. I printed out uh, reviews. Oh, Todd Doyle, Todd Doyle in Orcas Island. Okay. And every, every time cleanliness was mentioned in review, I highlighted it. 
Then if an adjective was used like very or exceptionally, I highlighted that. And then I paper clipped $5 for every clean and another 10 if there was an exceptional or, you know, a, a, a descriptor in it. And so she got $385 and wow. they really needed it. She said, she called back in tears and she said, my husband and I were both crying. He was sitting on the sofa and I was reading them to him and she said, <laughs> we'd turn the page and there'd be more money clipped. And he'd say, praise God, they really, <laughs> really <clears throat> needed it and it made a difference in their lives. So things like that make me so, so happy. That really is also an investment in the employee because the employee is happier and feels more fulfilled and feels more like they have more purpose because they're actually seeing the result of their good work. And oftentimes housekeeping and maintenance doesn't ever get to see that kind of thing. In the long run, that's helping uh, retain those employees. That's helping you avoid having to hire new employees, having to train new employees. So that's like almost like an investment, no? Exactly. And I tell Connie all the time, we couldn't do it without you. And luckily, she, she's never been sick. I don't know what we'll do if something happens to her. And she has other customers, but when she takes new clients, she tells them the farm comes first. You know, uh, I never know when I'm going to have to be there, but I'll I'll do you when I can. But you have to understand that the farm comes first. And she's always, we're a good team. She's, she's great. Now, folks, something Sharon just said deserves a call out. One way to find your magic zone is by asking hypotheticals. What happens if my best listing site or my all-star employee or my best property were to disappear tomorrow? This process forces you to think through the worst case scenarios and to create something of a backup plan. And more often than not, that backup plan strengthens your position when any market shift or industry change or accident or emergency or global pandemic arises. So let's get into your niche itself because you have as cornered of the market as I have ever seen. And how would you, how would we describe this? Is it, is it farm slash ranch vacation rentals? How do you describe it to folks? Well, one of your posts on the Inner Circle newsletter one week was a way to get extra income was to find niche posts. So I thought, well, let's see, I'm a farm. So I looked up farm stays. Well, there's a website, Farm Stay USA. So I signed up with them. Like a listing site almost. A listing site. Scotty Jones began it and she does a super job with it. And um, in fact, she emailed me yesterday, Matt. She said, Sharon, I was just looking at my VRMB newsletter and I saw your name. And so I called Kate and said, hey, look at this. And then she said, then I saw the blog post that we had done. And so she was thrilled. Yes. Yes. So give credit where credit's due. Uh, credit the Inner Circle and Scotty for doing a super job with her website. But over half now of all of my rentals come via that website. They find me there and then they go to my website and book direct, but they're actually looking for a farm stay. You know, the kids want to gather eggs. They want to interact with animals. Um, the farm experience, they get to ride tractors. So the way it's changed since COVID, kids can't ride in the tractor with the guys because of, you know, being right up, they're sitting in their lap or right next to them. So we give hay ride tours. Uh, we put a tractor in the front yard and let the kids climb all over it and play in it and take pictures with it. So we've adjusted so that they still can enjoy those things, just not right, you know, face to face. And before you were aware of Farms Day, um, like what's the advice here to somebody who maybe has a property or a handful of properties that are in a particular niche? Because prior to this, you didn't really know anything other than VRBO, right? Right. VRBO and Airbnb. So what was the, what's the, the advice there? See what you have that could be a niche, make it one. I was lucky that I hit farm stay right away because that was something that applied to me. Uh, it could be foodies. It could be pet friendly. It could be some kind of outdoor activity friendly. There's all these subsets. Yes. Popping up. Uh, pet friendly, probably 75, at least 75% of our guests bring their dogs. And I'm different than most pet friendly things. I don't require them to be crated. They can be on the furniture. I just, I ask them, I keep baskets with uh, covers for all the furniture. I said, if they want to be on it, please cover it because we can wash that. 
they're not required to be on a leash. So I say they have to be non-aggressive to people and other pets because other people are going to be here with their pets. Uh, and people tell me they love, it's the best they've ever had <laughs> with their pets because mm. most of them say pet friendly, but they have so many restrictions. They're really not. Right. And when we say, f- see, see what you, your niche can be. Uh, I love the theory of limited edition, and I would love for you to explain what the, uh, the origins of limited edition means to you when it comes to oranges with your pops. When it comes to oranges? Yes, limited edition oranges. Don't you remember? Ah, remind me. This is a chapter in your book that I spent uh, some time reading. Back in the day, uh, oranges were reserved for your your father, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Your father or your grandfather? My father. I grew up, when we grew up, uh, Would you like me to tell the story? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't remember all the details. <laughs> when I grew up, I was the oldest of six kids, so there was not a lot of money. Uh, Daddy worked really hard, and this was before Mama uh, got famous painting and, and uh, made a lot of money. And so oranges were for Daddy's lunch. The only time we got oranges as kids was at Christmas in our stockings. So... You know, I really, really appreciated the fruit. So uh, anything that's unique or unusual, special to you, you can make you can make it a special, uh, a limited edition. Uh, and that's why oranges were. Uh, I still love oranges. <laughs> you still asso- associate them with scarcity. Scarcity, yes. So something that's uh, not in good supply makes it more valuable. And I think the earlier a vacation rental professional is in their journey. The earlier they are with getting started and crafting that niche, the better. Because at some point it becomes hard to rethink things. So maybe it's a new property that you're considering taking on as a management contract. Maybe you're thinking about buying something. The more limited edition, the more personality, the more scarcity built into the supply, um, the more leverage you have as the as the purveyor, right? Exactly. Yes. Uh, People have commented the houses have a lot, the rental houses have a lot of mama's artwork in them and mine. I had one small blue bonnet painting in the Johnson White House, President Johnson. And (laughs) it was only because of mama, but I can still claim it. Um, People have said it's like, you know, staying in a living museum. We've had guests come that did not realize it was, you know, C.P. Montague's home until they got there and saw the paintings. And then, you know, like um, a family spent a week and she worked at A&M University and she said, oh, I'm in the auditing, de- the accounting department. And we've got so many of your mom's paintings in the in the uh, in our department. Uh, so that's special. It it means something to them. So, you know, it's I, I put that in my uh, in the website, in the description, but a lot of people, I guess, don't read everything and don't realize it. And I like how you just casually throw in there that you have a paint, you had a painting inside the White House, and that your mother became famous painting. Uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but what that this was, um, what kind of painting, and what was the relationship between your mother and the president? Mama painted landscapes. Uh, when she was discovered, she was painting still lifes, but they wanted her to paint landscapes, and she became one of the top landscape artists in in Texas in the Southwest and president Johnson was president at the time. And he commissioned, um, 50, it was called the Texana collection, 15 paintings around Austin because they owned the TV station, KTBC or KLBJ, sorry, KLBJ. And back in the day in the seventies and late sixties, they just had commercial breaks that were blank. So he thought we'll do, paintings that mama does like of the Capitol, the French legation, treaty Oaks, the Texas tower, different things around town and show those in the station breaks. And it'll be like advertising for tourism for Austin. And then he, Oh, they bought, I don't know how many paintings she had a a special showing in the, his uh, hangar and he bought everything they had taken. She painted for a month solid every day (laughs) between Christmas and new year's. Or January. And so I just kind of got in on her coattails. She taught me to paint and a lot of my paintings are in the houses also. And so is it fair to say that you like learning new stuff? <laughs> you strike me as somebody who's like constantly looking for some new skill. 
constantly. In fact, one year our accountant, we took the taxes in and he said, well, what new thing are you doing this year? He was talking about money making because I'm always <laughs> entrepreneurial trying to find a new way to make money. So <laughs> we've done a lot of different things. And would you say that that learning new things is kind of um, important in a vacation rental success? Oh, yes, man. Uh, in fact, if it weren't for your inner circle, Matt, I, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today. I have learned so much. And, and it's, you know, it's people think that you have to do big things. You don't. It's the little things that can make such a difference in the overall scheme of things and in the bottom line. So I keep going back to, I, I listen to these words through the, the lens of the farm that you grew up on and the farm that you learned life on. I'd like to get into t- like tools in your vacation rental business in just a moment, but explain to us kind of the role of tools on a farm, because I think it's very applicable to the actual software that you're using today. Oh man. Well, uh, tools are, we got, uh, we had a 500 year flood in 2010 and David rented a skid steer to pick up all the debris that the flood had left in the pecan orchard. And we had a, like a 15 acre heavily wooded area. And I told Dan, I said, we literally could try to clear this all day, every day, the rest of our lives. And we couldn't. So we hired bulldozers to clear it. But we realized with that skid steer, how much easier it made work and how much quicker. So we bought one. How much does that cost? Ooh, (laughs) 50,000. Wow. But see, the vacation rental business has been great because I got into it not needing the income, really. I mean, it's been fantastic, but we have used it for the farm, uh, paying our grandkids' college education. In fact, we've got two in college coming up in September. Uh, One's graduated, and the last two will be in college at the same time. Yay. So, but anyway, the... The skid steer has been a huge, huge help, makes life easier. So yesterday the boys were using it to load dirt out of my garden from last year and they're rebuilding. And so they use the forklift to lift the um, pallets of cinder blocks off the trailer. The trailer is another thing that we use all the time because we have to haul brush. You're, you're always clearing something on 172 acres. It's never, the work's never done. So we'll never run out of something to do no matter how old we get. And tell me, so like the, the application here, you, you in, in, in the farm life, you're switching from manual to tool that does things much more efficiently. Give us an example or two of a manual process that you now either automate or use a tool for with your vacation rental business. Okay. Two of them, uh, touch stay, I found on your website, uh, VRMB. Uh, Shout out to Andy. Yes. Andy McNulty. Yes. The welcome book is fantastic. Guests comment on it. Guests use it. Um, I signed up with the owner res, again, uh, recommended through Inner Circle members. And that has made life so much easier because I had different calendars. And so making sure all of my calendars are synced. Uh, it sends out, you know, it took a little initial time setting up the letters I want to go out and telling them when, like the welcome letter, uh, the payments, uh, you know, different things. So that has really saved a lot of time. And that's a property management software for anybody who doesn't know the name. And a property management software really aims to do the heavy lifting the man of all the manual tasks that would be either boring or inefficient if they were to be done manually, like sending out the exact same email to every guest prior to arrival. Uh, And the guest book would be a streamlined version of a manual guest book being printed out and handed over to guests and having coffee spilled on it. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's uh, it has everything. I just don't print the copies. They can put it on their telephone and then it has restaurants, grocery stores, golf court, you know, things to do, things to do on the farm, things to do if they get here early and, uh, you know, can't check in yet. Um, it's just got all kinds of information, driving directions, you know, how to use appliances in the house, um, just all, anything that I think they might need while they're here, they can find in that guest book, that welcome book. And how do you like, there's a lot of software and technology on the market. There's so many tools right now uh, at the disposal. Um, how do you 
manage all of that? Because you can't possibly be trying out all of them. Like what's the prism that you look through in order to decide if you're going to use a software and, or like actually begin demoing it? I listen to people that have commented on the inner circle who have tried different things. And I read, you know, they had problems with this or it was uh, too tech, you know, too technical and I'm not technical. So I knew that that wouldn't be for me if it had a steep learning curve. I let other people do the test driving and I listen to their advice and I've been very, very happy with both choices. I guess those are the only really things that I have um, on the tech side that I have signed up and used. Okay. Well, we're going to get into some of the more uh, non-tech, the more human hospitality gestures in just a moment, but let's talk real quickly about how these kinds of tools affect your reviews, which are not necessarily uh, profit, but they are directly correlated with profit. Uh, Sometimes you get, sometimes you get got. That's a that's a Sharon phrase. What, what's what's the the principle behind the review uh, philosophy? The reviews uh, I love and people I, when they're here, and I'm giving a tour or when I'm taking the muffins, you know, at some point I'm, I'll be talking with them, and so I tell them, you know, as owners, we live and die by reviews. So please, when you leave, would you please leave us a review? And ninety percent of them do through listing sites. Airbnb and Verbo, I can request it. And I learned uh, on Verbo, don't leave them a review until they've left you one. Because once you leave it, they've got two weeks to leave it and then that's it. But if if I wait, then I can request a review from them later on. <clears throat> so that's something I learned the hard way. And how are you choosing which platform to ask for the review on? Is it the same platform on which they book? Is it to you directly? The platform they booked on. I've got a new website. And uh, he's, uh, co- I've copied and pasted, and we're going to put those reviews on my website so that when people go to the website, and it will tell HomeAway or Airbnb or whoever, but uh, the reviews can all be there. But I request it wherever they book. And Sharon, when I hear the website thing, to us uh, on the professional side here, it's quite common for any small business, like a vacation rental business, to have their own website. Um, but Speak to the the difference between like what was the what was the process of building that website and what was the impact on the business like tangible or otherwise very very tangible and I love what we've come up with and now a word from our sponsors this episode is brought to you by Point Central the leaders in smart home automation and instead of me telling you how great I think they are or reading off of some kind of script that Andy or Sean sent me. Here's one of the industry's most influential technology experts, Terry White, when I asked him why Point Central is such a game changer. I use them, so I know the product pretty well. I would say their customer service is outstanding, but what they provide is, you know, remote locks, thermostat, door and window sensors, uh, light control, leak detection, you know, it's pretty hard to beat. but. When I was looking and I was demoing all these products because I was looking for the solution for myself, I had access to someone who used to work at Point Central and he was probably very highly rated in the industry, had a great reputation. And so I had access to him. So I approached him. I said, I'm demoing all these companies, doing all this stuff. He says, you can demo every company that you want. He says, but I'll tell you right now, you're going to end up at Point Central. And so that's exactly what happened too. Outstanding company, for sure. I could not have said it any better myself. Point Central is now accepting property managers with less than 25 properties, which gives all of us the excuse to get a little more connected. Head over to pointcentral.com slash VRMB to learn more. and Breezeway, a property care and automation platform that solves the challenges of ensuring clean, safe, and high quality properties in the wake of the pandemic. And instead of hyping Breezeway myself, here's Christina Thorinson of Chattanooga Vacation Rentals when I asked her what's the single technology shift that she considers most important to her business. 
I think um, there are some folks on the property care housekeeping side that are doing some really cool stuff with um, Mm -hmm. confirming sanitization and disinfecting of properties that I think where we're, we're going to see technology with every housekeeper has a cell phone and they're checking into their system and checking out when they're done. They are taking pictures of the chemicals they're using and the spaces they've cleaned. And I think that mm-hmm. is a technology shift. That's something that the guest might be able to access directly moving forward. Mm, I like that. Let's give, a, let's give a shout out. Who are you, who are you talking about right now? Um, well, I see Jeremy Gall, Jeremiah Gall and Breezeway does some really cool stuff with that. You know, they're, they're trying to do some things where they're incorporating that tech that's already available in the smartphone to help increase the guest's level of comfort, which I think is good. I couldn't have said that any better myself. Head over to breezeway.io slash VRMB, where you can do a free demo and secure free implementation if you decide to sign on. That's roughly a $1,000 value. That's breezeway.io slash VRMB. Now let's get back to the show. You, Sharon, to me, are the ultimate limited edition vacation rental professional uh, because you have really focused on that niche. You've really put a lot of effort into making just your personality is running throughout this business from the moment somebody comes across your website to the moment they interact with the, uh, with somebody for an inquiry. My guess is that that's you. Yes. That reservations course coordinator is you. Yeah. Uh, to the moment they arrive at the property and, and probably meet you or Dan at some point in passing to the moment they depart and sort of keeping your business in the front of, um, front of their radar. This is all very, very powerful stuff, but I want to talk a little bit about the role of all of that in your greater community, because this is an area for me in which you just take things to the next level. So let's start off with just your general philosophy on the role of a vacation rental business in any given community. Well, I think that we need to be good citizens of our community, give back. I ha- I feel very, 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 very blessed. Um, and at this stage of my life, I want to give back. And I have, since I retired, um, I've done a lot of volunteering and I've, I've used that in my vacation rental home. I've, I've helped the community through furnishing my vacation rental homes. I have volunteered for 15 plus years at the Caring Place, which is like a local Goodwill thrift store, except it's so much more. We provide um, all kinds of services for neighbors in need. But for pennies on the dollar, I beautifully furnished from the floor up to the <laughs> to the curtains on the, the windows, both of the rentals. And we have some very expensive uh neighborhoods in Georgetown. So I, you know, it took about six months to furnish each one, but they are beautifully furnished and people cannot believe that everything in those homes came from a thrift store. So every dollar I spent furnishing the homes goes back into feeding someone or clothing or giving medical help to, um, to someone in need in my community. Uh, the last four years, I've been on the board of directors, and it has been a great honor. I have totally, totally enjoyed that process. Um, I tell all my guests about it, so they know, and they'll say, that rug came from the caring place, or uh, this whatever. I said, from everything in this house except Mama's paintings and my paintings came from the caring place. So they shop there. Um, they love it. They feel like they're getting great values. They are also helping my community. The more I hear about um, community giving, uh, the more, the less esoteric it becomes and the more immediately related to a vacation rental business's bottom line. If a business, and I've kind of come to this conclusion that a business can fall into one of two cycles or loops The first one is the positive one, the virtuous cycle in which you're doing a good job contributing to the local community, whether it's volunteering 
or making donations. Like you said earlier, you donated your, um, what was it? Your, your pickled vegetables or was it non-pickled? Non-pickled, fresh. (laughs) Non-pickled. Whether it's donating or simply like your Apple stand for the local um, pickup crew, right? Either you're doing those things and your community is in turn receiving your guests more warmly or, and this is the, the, the trap that I think is easy to fall into, especially if you don't live in the same property or city as your vacation rental properties, you don't do those things. The neighbors begin to get bothered by irresponsible guests and noise, and it starts making real negative impacts in your streets. And then the exact opposite thing happens. Your destination becomes less appealing to a, des- to a traveler over time. And that's a vicious cycle. So to me, hearing the efforts that you're putting forth are, are way less just nice ideas that can come at the end of a vacation rental career and more things that should be baked into a model from the very start. If somebody was getting started today, would you encourage them to bake something in? Oh, absolutely. Guests appreciate it. They know that you're giving back. And they like staying with someone like that. And and you mentioned something. I think by living on the farm, people meet me. They meet the family. And in going over those reviews for Connie with cleanliness, I was amazed at how many, the majority, the vast majority of people mentioned meeting the family, how nice the family was. That means so much in today's society, I think. So I'm very, very fortunate that I can do that. And I realize a lot of people can't. Anyone that can give back to their community in any way, I think, is great. I, another way I give back, every year the Caring Place has, a, until COVID, <laughs> we had a big fundraiser, our big annual fundraiser, and I would donate a weekend at, at one of the homes. So easy. Yeah, so easy. Uh, and yet it raised a lot of money for them. Not to mention the exposure of your brand in the community. True, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I also donate weekends. I, I figured up I donate about 10, 10% of the weekends to different charities, school, Girl Scouts, a church ladies group that I uh, attend a big conference in every year, this time of the year, except this year we won't because of COVID. And so it's, you know, it's, it's helped a lot, of, a lot of different organizations, but I really, really like doing it local more than, you know, long distance. Yeah. In, in my uh, neighborhood there of Casco Viejo in Panama, which was a very emerging community where everybody's contributions really mattered, really made a direct impact. I, I found myself one time looking at all the businesses in town that seemed to be succeeding versus all the businesses that were really struggling with uh, a season of terrible tourism. And all of the ones that were succeeding still had owners or at least very committed managers who are on site, on the ground, there to smile, um, there to give you advice in person. And I'm, I'm now transporting myself to today. It could be still in person, maybe it doesn't have to be super close, could keep a couple feet social distance, but it still seems to me like a big differentiator. And oppositely, if you don't have any presence, any interaction, on a human level, from the moment the guest arrives to the moment the guest departs, you're kind of missing out on the biggest limited edition virtue, no? Yes, exactly. And do you know, I can honestly say in the 11 years now that I have been operating, I have never yet had a bad experience. I've never had noise. I did have one, <laughs> a guy, a family came from North Carolina their son had just gotten off of a submarine and we went down to take muffins and he was sitting out on the back patio playing an electric guitar that was plugged in and it was rock. <laughs> I said, I am so sorry. But I said, we have guests next door. And I said, he can't be playing that outside. And she said, well, we finally sent him outside because he was driving us crazy. <laughs> she said, That's how he relaxes. And I said, well, I am so sorry, but he's going to have to come back inside. So that was the only time that I've had noise. And luckily, I, I discovered it before it became a problem. <laughs> John, uh, John Odin. 
another Inner Circle member who we visited there in Nashville with his wife, Ellen. Uh, I think they call it the, the cushion, uh, which is the goodwill that you earn uh, in case something might go wrong. If you are present, if you are there and have put forth a little bit of effort into the uh, arrival, a little bit of effort into being accessible in case they have questions. If something does go wrong, which we know vacation rentals, it will, having that cushion uh, and saving that you know five-star review, let's say, it, it has a direct impact on the bottom line. Absolutely. I had one that had I not been there and had I not been, as they said, the nicest person ever, I'm sure I would have gotten a bad review. They came for a their son's wedding and asked if they could have the rehearsal dinner. And I said, sure, it wasn't going to be too large. But I said, now, you know, the weather could be bad, so you'll have to make other arrangements. Well, they were supposed to have 35 people, ended up with 75 in the house because it was they thought it was going to rain. And she was unhappy because the space wasn't... <laughs> accommodating for 75 people. And so because I was nice, she did not leave a review, luckily. And Dan said, okay, no more weddings, no more rehearsal dinners, because uh, you can't control. You know, they said it'd be 35 outside, but it was 75 inside. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the, the negative things that happened, some of the challenges, because it's not been completely straightforward for you. You're an optimistic person. You're very positive all the time. Um, but there are times when you kind of have to make difficult decisions. Um, how do you, how do you guide other vacation rental colleagues? How do they make that call? Like what's the best way to avoid getting even deeper into a ditch? Cut your losses. Uh, be nice. I had one lady that stayed and, um, she told me that she had to sleep sitting up in the recliner because uh, I can't remember if it's breathing problems or bad back. Um, but then the day she left, she wrote me and said, well, you know, she had found something on the, uh, a spot on the bed and, but she had a dog and the cabin wasn't clean and she would be happy to come and clean for me if she could have a free weekend. <laughs> So she left me a five-star review. I did not leave her review until after she left hers. And she's on my do not rent list. She was just someone that was working to, uh, she would love, you know, another free weekend. And the ca the cabin was spotlessly clean. You could eat off the floors when Connie gets through. And she'd already told me she didn't sleep on the bed. Uh, I mean, she said the bed was not comfortable. Uh, but she had already told me she couldn't sleep on the bed because of her back. She had to sleep in a, a recliner. Just be nice and cut it off. Don't keep the back and forth. Explain your situation. And I probably am more generous. <laughs> um, I think from the guest point of view, a lot of times, I know that I refund sometimes that other people would not, but I try to put myself in their shoes and um, we get booked so frequently that I know that if I let that weekend go and let them rebook later, uh, it probably will fill up. So I, I don't, being the, the one that people talk to, it's not like I have hard and fast rules that if you book after this time or cancel after this time, you get no refund. Uh, I make a lot of exceptions, which drives Dan crazy. And I said, well, that's the great thing about being, being the owner and being the one in charge and talking to people. I can make those decisions. Um, one thing I have found is that I love to talk people on the, on the telephone. I, it's amazing to me on some of these different uh, websites that for vacation rentals, how people will not talk on the phone. They want everything a written record. And I thought you are missing the boat. People tell me so many times, as soon as I get that phone number, I call and welcome them and they'll say, thank you so much for calling. I never expected that. You know, no one's ever called them before. So things like that tend to head off. Like you said, if some little something does happen to go wrong, it's not that big a deal because they know you, uh, you have become and will become a friend during that short stay with them. So have that personal contact. Something else I'm doing that I learned on your site is writing handwritten thank you notes. So 
Daniel, one of my oldest son, is a photographer, lives on the farm. He took some great photos for me, and I had cards made. I have a sister that owns a print shop, so I can get them made really, really <laughs> inexpensively. And so I send those, and so it's just a, a reminder, a thank you for choosing to stay with us. You know, I know they had a lot of different choices. And we have a, a thread going all about the most profitable or green activities a vacation rental professional can focus their time and energy on. And you just nailed them. I mean, reservations, uh, taking that extra step to call somebody, uh, making the time to write that handwritten note. Those are the little things that have just exponentially greater returns and ultimately get you the repeat bookings, get you the referrals, get you the direct bookings. And I think it, it's dangerous to get complacent or to get lazy. I know towards the end of my vacation rental management career, uh, I wasn't like as ex excited to jump up and call somebody. Um, do you think it's fair to say that the moment that you lose that excitement or passion or motivation, you either need to hire somebody or you need to think about whether the business is doing it for you? Yes. As long as it's fun and I feel like I'm engaged and in it, it's going to be successful. I want you to really pay attention to what Sharon's saying here. Your magic zone is your dream lifestyle business. And so long as it's fun, you get to continue operating. You can take a page out of Sharon's book when you feel it start to not being fun. You can add a new bucket list style project to your mix. Using your small business almost like a vehicle, almost like a Trojan horse for your lifestyle fulfillment, that is a pretty beautiful thing. But it's like anything else. It's like you don't keep a house up and just little things start to fall apart and uh, make a difference. So uh, that's one reason I like doing different things. We started the farm stand in October and it's been hugely successful. And it's been so much fun. We have met so many of our neighbors. We have two gated communities now on either side of us and uh, great neighbors <laughs> found out that uh, several of them sit on their back patios a quarter mile away and watch us through binoculars. <laughs> Oh, that's creepy. Why are they doing that? <laughs> Just to see what's going on over there. All right. <laughs> They're loving it. And so they keep up with the gardens and, and I, you know, uh, it does sound creepy, but they admit it. Uh, <laughs> one of them even stayed with us. She uh, booked it for her husband's birthday and she told him, do not look at the credit card. We're going to go somewhere special for your birthday. Got in the car and she said, I'm driving. And he said, well, how long is it going to take? And she said, you'll see. <laughs> it was across their back pasture, directly across from the houses. Oh, my gosh. How cool. And they had a ball. Uh, he said, you know, and she was one. We watch with binoculars. We've always been fascinated with what y'all are doing over there, all the different equipment and the, you know, machinery. And uh, one of the ladies said she had named our horses Blaze and Glory, and she loved watching the goats. And uh, they got right up on her fence line, so they were close to her. So, you know. Uh, the gardens, planting those kitchen gardens for the people. Uh, and we rebuilt them this year. The boys built new ones last year. So having the kids here uh, and they meet the guests when they're out walking, they visit with them. Everyone is personable. People love it. Uh, they feel like they're part of the family by the time they leave, especially if they stay more than two nights where they're you know out and about on the farm. And so I want to move into the last question. We've talked about how to fundamentally start um, and grow a, a diversified marketing portfolio. One of the biggest pieces of it that surprises a lot of folks is that you do have to do the listing site independence stuff, like build a website and have a logo and build your own brand. But a huge piece of the repeat and referral booking marketing strategy is being a fantastic host. I mean, if you really wow somebody when they stay with you, that becomes the single best investment you can make in your direct booking strategy. We've talked about doing stuff in your local community. You're someone who I like to say does all the little things that are necessary in order to achieve what you define as success. Tell us how all of that uh, manifests in what's arguably the most complicated realm to measure, that is PR. 
and being featured in press. Like, I feel like you have to do all those things in order to get the press, right? I have been really, really fortunate. Um, I think Scotty Jones with Farmstay USA probably recommended me to um, South Magazine. I, th- I think she probably recommended a lot of people. And then, um, let's see, there was another one. Um, she, oh, last week did a fantastic blog post on the farm and they did a really, really good job. She had asked me to send her information about the farm and how we got started and all of that and some photos. And then they had a writer that took it and really dressed it up. And it was, it was, (laughs) I thought it was outstanding. I loved it. So knowing people in the business that kind of put your name out there, Fromers was another one. I think Scotty may have mentioned her. I don't know how Fromers found us. But uh, we were one of six farm stays that were listed in an article on Frommers, which blew me away. Um, I think that we were one of six, again, farms that were featured for farm stays in the South Magazine. And then just little things like uh, the newspaper guy came out and took photos when they were doing the trash pickup. We had apples that we knew they were going to be uh, picking up trash, so we had apples to give them and they had stopped and were visiting. And he mentioned Scarlock Farms in the front page of the newspaper in the article. Uh, we had a deer that we were attacked by a deer. <laughs> and so I called the newspaper. How did that happen? It was walking along. It was the Friday before Thanksgiving. We were taking a tote of stuff into the pallet pad. And this deer was walking around a rock ledge. And I told Dan, I said, shh, he doesn't see us. Well, he came right for us. Well, I had this empty tote in my hand, and I told Dan, I said, get in the truck, and I'll hold him off. Well, he attacked that tote and <laughs> his antlers and tore it up. And Dan said, you get in the truck. <laughs> they wrestled. It was a fight to the death. The deer was trying to gore him, and he luckily he had grabbed his antlers right at his head, and as long as he tried to keep his head down, he couldn't get to him and for almost 10 minutes. And finally, I told Dan, I said, get in the house, get in the house. So he led, drug, whatever, got in the house, and he was bleeding. As I called David, our son's a police officer. Anyway, David ended up shooting him. Um, So I called the newspaper. Well, Dan and David had a fit, and I said, well, people need to know. Uh, And the game warden said, this is rutting season, and you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, a TV producer for the news in Austin saw it, so they came out and did a live newscast the next night. And did it. Well, David, being a police officer, did not want to be on TV, but he, as soon as it was over, he ran down and I said, well, how did it go? And he said, well, you look good. But he said, mom, you sounded kind of (laughs) hicky. Did they ask you to recreate the attack? (laughs) On TV? Yeah, we did. They did? That's amazing. So I showed them how they wrestled. The, the only thing that's more impressive than Dan fending off uh, uh, a deer is the fact that you told him to get in the car that you were going to handle it. Right. <laughs> well, I had the tub. I thought that tub was going to protect us. I love <laughs> but he that. just threw it up. <laughs> look, for a, look for yourself and a spouse what, what, what Sh- Sharon offers Dan in a situation like that. The, the chance <laughs> to fend off from wild beasts. <laughs> Uh, last question, my dear, because we're nearing in on one hour. Do you have any big goals for Skurlock Farms moving into the next few years? I Actually, I do. I've got the door closed, so Dan won't hear me. Okay. <laughs> I would love to have a hay maze, a corn maze. Ooh. Uh, I've done them before, and um, I was reading uh, a thing on, oh, it's on, farm stays and that do things like this, the, the big things. But I would love, and it's, it may not happen in my lifetime, but I, we've got plenty of space. I think it's something the boys might enjoy doing, but I would love to see a farm, uh, you know, a corn maze for guests to come and enjoy. So that's just something that you've always wanted to do and your, your vacation rental is kind of like the vehicle or excuse to actually do it? Yeah. The kids had thought about putting in like uh, little cabins back in the woods but we would, you know, electricity and water would be a main, a real problem. And Dan said, <laughs> two rentals are enough. Uh, he said that the boys can do that later if they want to. So I don't think we'll try to add any more to the farm. I did have the third, third home that was a vacation rental and it was booked all the time. We called it uh, Indian Bluff. But when Daniel decided to move back to the farm, 
He couldn't wait to leave when he was 19, started his own business, IT business in Dallas, and came back to the farm, you know, once or twice a year. He realized how much he missed it. So they sold their business and moved back to the farm two and a half years ago. And he bought that house. So now we only have the two. So Dan says two is enough. <laughs> well, we will we will also give uh, Daniel, your son, credit because he's also the technical um, advisor for this interview, right? Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for not only today's conversation and sharing all your wonderful wisdom with our listeners, but all these years, every time I see an email from you, it starts with a pleasantry, something funny or interesting that's happening around your farm or your life. It gets into something meaningful, a lesson, something you achieved, a question that you had, always ends with something equally fun. And you, to me, just embody the, the dream vacation rental colleague. And I know you don't necessarily see yourself uh, as one, but to me, you really are one of the absolute leaders of this new movement. So thank you for um, coming on today. And I didn't get to half of the sayings that I wanted to include, including, excuse me, lady, I think you have the wrong hand. <laughs> that was the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Okay, well, sh tell people what it is because I, I, we can't just like leave a cliffhanger and then we'll end. I'm a race horse and Dan's the plow horse. That's how we describe ourselves. So he's pulling me back and I'm pulling him forward. So I'm always walking two or three steps ahead of him. We were in Acapulco at a resort and we're going to breakfast and this long line is beside us waiting to get into the buffet and I realize I'm ahead of him again. So I reach back and grab his hand and we walk a couple of steps and this man says, excuse me, lady, I think you have the wrong hand. And I had almost asked him, why is your hand so sweaty? <laughs> and I look back and the man's wife was with Dan. I had reached back and grabbed a total stranger's hand. <laughs> you were trying to do things too fast. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, I was as red as a tomato. <laughs> well, we, we, that, that's why we love you. And I would like to use that to conclude. Thank you once again. Today was great. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the comments, Matt. And I couldn't have done it without you. That's for sure. Thanks for listening to today's interview. If you'd like to download a full transcript of this conversation, along with links to resources that we mentioned, and perhaps collaborate with our guests, each of whom are members of VRMB communities, head over to community vrmb.com and click register. Our community is for folks who don't want to do it the hard way or alone. They want to use the path of least resistance. No reinventing the wheel here. Just copying the best practices to vacation rental growth that are out there. We like to think that we have the most creative vacation rental professionals in the world, all under one virtual roof. That's community.vrmb.com slash register. Yes,